level just a little bit. I was listening to some preaching today on the way home from work as I was sitting in traffic. And T.D. Jakes brought out some good points about something, and he usually does because he's better than me and older than me and smarter than me and wiser than me and whatever. But he was talking about how the enemy fights you for the territory that you hold. He's not so much worried about you per se, but he's worried about the area around you, the people involved with you. So if we allow him to control us and destroy us, then he can most likely destroy the people around us. So of course my mind got to rolling with that. You know, I was thinking, you know, the Lord must be really up to something, really going to do something cool because the enemy's really been fighting hard. Anybody else besides me? Come on. Come on. Here's the thing about the enemy fighting me. I he and I have gone at this a number of times, if you know what I mean. We've fought numerous times. And I think I'm getting enough gray in my head to understand that when he fights the most, he's intimidated the most. Does that make sense? When he fights the most, he's intimidated the most. Forgive me if I start to cry because I feel it building in me, but when he starts to raise the most fuss, I think he's a little worried about something. When he starts to push a little bit harder, he's concerned that you're about to do something great. You're about to do something that can hurt him, that can destroy him, that can take away a territory from him. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do tonight, okay? And your praise will demonstrate this. It's easy to come into church on a Thursday night tired. I'm tired. It's easy to come into the church on a Thursday night aggravated, upset about something, worried about something, concerned about... Maybe you're just sick. And the easiest thing to do in a situation like that is just sit. Not to really put a whole lot in. Not to really do anything great. You know what I mean? Or we can push through all that. Dustin, come here for a sec. I'll give you just a little bit of good news here, okay? Ready? Uh, I got a new job down here at FedEx. Hey! Woo! Hey! I'm making two more dollars an hour. Now, I'm excited about that because that means more tithes. <laughs> Amen. But at the same time, I think I said it to him the other week, God's about to do something for you, not because you need another job, but because he wants to bless you. Amen. So tonight, I think if we press through all that stuff and just really worship the Lord with everything we've got, we may put a whipping on the enemy tonight. Anybody up for that? I'm up for that. I don't know about you. You've got a big hand clap right now. Would you do that, please? Let's go to prayer and invite the Lord into the service, can we? Father, we are so thankful to be in your house tonight, God. Thankful for your blessings. God, we're thankful, God, that you've watched after us this week, God, that you've gone before us. You have fought the battles for us, great God. Father, you have defeated the enemy for us. Father, I pray right now, God, that you would just sweep through this place tonight god let your spirit fill each and every vessel that's here lord and father accept our praise right now god for all the things that you have done for us in jesus name we pray amen remain standing if you can praise the lord they said there's nothing coming through the monitors guys they said nothing's coming out of the monitors up here all right have you come ready to worship tonight? Praise his holy name. Well, I once was lost in sin. What did he say? Do a test. Do a test. Okay. Go ahead, Lori. 
talking that one. Make sure it's coming out. Test. Yeah. Okay. Misty talking that one. Joan talking. Test. We good? All right. We're good. Let's try this again. Well, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. Well, it made my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk when Jesus made me whole. Come on now. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Oh, let us tell him all about us. Well, he will hear our cry. And he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in. Though a little fire is burning. A little talk with Jesus makes it right. Well, I may have doubts and fears. My eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. Well, I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Come on, I'm here. Now let us have a little talk. And let us tell him all about our Well, he will hear our Oh, he's going to answer by and by now When you feel a little prayer will turn in Oh, a little fire is burning Find a little talk with you Come on, let me hear you tonight Now let us Now let us have a little talk And let us tell him all about Well, he will hear our faith He's going to answer by and by now When you feel a little prayer will turn in Oh, a little fire is burning Find a little talk with you Let's do that second verse of time Sometimes my passing day without a way of cheer And then a cloud of doubt behind the light of day Well, the mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies But just a little talk with Jesus goes away Let me hear you, come on Now let us have a little talk And let us tell him all about our troubles He will hear our faith Oh, he's gonna answer by and by now When you hear a little prayer will Oh. 
in the praise team. But that same presence of God that was here Sunday night is the same presence of God that's here tonight because our God is unchanging. Amen. I want you just to lift up holy hands tonight as we sing unchanging. So we raise up holy hands Praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Yeah, we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and Your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. 
rocks will cry out in praise. Praise the Lord. Thank you for praying with me. My granddaughter found a church. She's so happy. Yesterday, I went down to my daughter's house. My seven-year-old granddaughter, her brother Steve go. He was singing Shake. How about that? Seven-year-old. Brianna, I called the other night to talk to her. My son said, she's at church. I said, well, where are you? I'm home. So the word of God says, and a child shall lead him. So I tell Brianna every time she comes to the house, Brianna, you got to talk to your mommy and daddy. You got to tell them. They need to take you and them cherubs to church. Thank the Lord. Thank you for praying. When I ask for prayer, that's one thing I know about you folks here. You will pray. Thank you. Go ahead.
It's time to take up our tithes and offerings. If this was one, go ahead and come on up, and we will have Sarah pray over the offering. Most of you guys know you see me limping around here walking around here like I'm a dead man with my back bothering me and everything else and one of the things that that is teaching me is that I really cannot do anything without Jesus Christ even something as simple as walking you know to be able to stand here tonight upright is, is a miracle in and of itself because he's the one providing the strength for me to do this so this is a familiar song to many of us so if you know it please sing along <clears throat> well I thought that number one would surely be me and I thought I could be whatever I wanted to be well I thought that I could do on my second sin, but I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. For that mountain's too high, and Lord, that valley. Julie, come on up. You know, today um, I was listening to T a sermon by T. Jakes, and in his sermon, he was talking about how, you know, we're very emotional people, and a lot of times we act off of our emotions or 
how we're feeling. And he started talking about, you know, the helmet of salvation and knowledge. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when it comes to our relationship with God, you know, it dicta- you know, our relationship with God dictates how we're feeling that day or whatever is happening. And, you know, he was talking about how, you know, sometimes you have to just go off of what you know. You know, you have to go off of what the Bible says and the knowledge that you have and stand on that. And I know that it's Thursday night and we're all tired, but I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And, you know, as I, the words are going to be up here. And, you know, as I do this song, you know, I don't know what everybody's been dealing with, what everybody's been going through, how your week has been. But, you know, try to get all of that out of your mind and worship God because, you know, our feelings, our emotions, that doesn't change who God is. And, you know, we should worship him regardless of whether we're tired or whatever is going on. So just worship with me. Oh uh-huh. 
believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Come on! Brenda Jones at home sick. I know we've got Paula Green at home sick. Clayton, I think, is here tonight with a little bit of sickness in him. Anybody else feeling under the weather? Steve under the weather, Lonnie under the weather, Bonnie under the weather, Amanda under the weather, Kevin. All right, we got a lot of folks under the weather. Good Lord's been after me for a while about stressing the importance of prayer okay because i think sometimes we forget to pray or if we don't forget to pray it's just one of those quick prayers i know you feel like a yo-yo tonight but would you stand with me one more time please i don't want you getting too comfortable Tell you what, if you guys think you're overworked in a service, come hang out with me for a week. You'll come in here and think, man, this is cakewalk, right, Amanda? I've had her Tuesday and Wednesday this week, and I've been working her. Amen. Do you believe God still heals? Does God care about a cold? Does he care about a flu? Does he care about an achy back? Does he care about a worried mind? I believe he does. I believe he cares about all things, don't you? I believe he cares about everything. If you're here tonight and you want special prayer, I'm just going to ask you to come forward. Special prayer, please. If you want special prayer. I need my preachers. Come on up here, Brother Jack. If you need special prayer, you can stay there. It's cool. Huh? Got a black eye. I gotta say something here. Ever since Steve's been dating Misty, he's had hay fever and something else wrong with his eyes. I'm just saying. Something fishy going on there. Come here, Norm. Are you sick too? Sick of Maxine? Line up here, guys, if you're sick, please. Just line up across. Norman's going to anoint you. And we're going to pray. Listen, when we pray, let's pray in sincerity. Let's pray in faith believing. There was a family here Sunday morning, the Bays family. They sit back here in the back. And Marty, he uh, fell off of his motorcycle last week. And when he did, he broke his collarbone. And he severed his ligament. 
They said they can do surgery, but it's probably not going to do a whole lot of good. So I know he's not here tonight, but we're going to pray for Marty as well because Marty needs to be healed. That family needs to be healed completely. You you know what I mean when I say the family needs to be healed completely? Because sometimes things have happened in the past and it just really rocks you, knocks you off the rails a little bit, and you still love God, you still serve God, but nowhere near what you used to. So they need prayer. We're just going to pray for all these guys together. Those of you that are in your seats, would you raise your hands and aim them toward these folks? And I want to hear you praying for them. Can we do that, please? Let's begin to pray. Father, we come before you now, Lord God. We pray, God, for each and every individual, God, that's in this altar here tonight, God. Father, we pray for Marty and Randy Bates, God, where they're at right now, Lord. Father, we pray that you would touch their bodies. I pray, God, that you would touch my dad's eyes, great God. I pray that you would touch his legs, great God. Father, I pray, God, that you would touch Steve, God, and help him with his hay fever, great God. We pray for Kevin, God, and we pray for a man, Lord God, that you would move up on these knees. Father, anoint them, bless them, God, strengthen them, God, heal them right now, Lord, we pray. Father, we pray for Brenda, God, and we pray for Paul, Lord God, that you would move up on those needs, Father. God, that you would heal them, God, those folks that are home, great God, because they're perplexed in their mind, Lord. Father, I pray that you would deliver them, God, of their issues there, Lord. Father, we'll give you praise, God, for everything, for everything, for everything, for everything, Lord. In Jesus' holy name, amen. If you believe God has moved up on all these requests, would you give him a big hand clap, please? You can be seated if you want. going to sing every time I sing it it, the the chorus of it especially reminds me of a story in 2nd Kings in chapter 7 that uh, there was four leprous men and when your choices are die die and die so you know which one is the best choice right because Samaria had been besieged by the Syrian army and all their food supply had been cut off. And of course, leopards couldn't be part of the community. They were unclean. So they're sitting outside the gates. Everybody's starving. It's a bad situation. People have been eating their own children even. They've been eating feces. It's been bad, okay? So your choices are stay here and die, go into the city and die, or let's go out to the Syrian army. Who knows? They may show us some kindness. And if they don't, we're going to die. So when your choices are die, die, and die, go ahead and die. Because God has a better plan. Amen? Because... When they got there, because they said, we're just going to go there. And they got there, and guess what? There was no army. Man, they had a feast. Everything had been left. You know? And then they said, we better go tell, go back and tell everybody, lest something worse happen to us. We can't keep this to ourselves. So, when things are looking grim, when things are looking bad, just keep pressing on. Go on, go on to the enemy's camp. Who knows? The Lord may just supply your need by your enemy. Amen. Now when the Lord let down the hedge on Job to try him, he took all of his children and everything Job owned. But old Job didn't sit down and cry. He just lifted his head up higher and came out of that valley. Thank God with a whole lot more. Well, I'm going to walk right out of this valley, lift my hands and praise the Lord. Said, I ain't going to let old Satan get me down, down, down. Why should I sit here till I die? And there's a weight just a little bit higher. And I'm going to walk out of this valley with my Lord. Now the road that you got to travel to that city. 
city It won't always be on the mountain top Oh, but the valleys we gotta face God said he's gonna give us grace Come on that mountain Where the sun is shining bright And I'm gonna walk right out of this valley With my hands and praise the Lord It ain't gonna let down, down, down. Why should I sit here till I die? Heaven's a way just a little bit higher. Now I'm going to walk out this valley with my Lord. Now when the Lord let down the hedge on Job to try him, he took all of his children and everything Job owned. But old Job didn't sit down and cry. He just lifted his head up higher and came out of that valley. Thank God we're the whole lot more. I'm going to walk right out of this valley with my hands and praise the Lord. But ain't going to let old Saint get me down, down, down. Why should I sit here till I die? Heaven's a weight just a little bit higher. And I'm going to walk out of this valley with my Lord. Now the road that you got to travel to that city. It won't always be on the mountain top. Oh, but the valley we gotta face. God said He's gonna give us grace. Come on that mountain where the sun is shining bright. And I'm gonna walk right out this valley with my hands and praise the Lord. So I ain't gonna let Oh, Saint, get me down, down, down. Why should I sit here till I die? Heaven's away just a little bit higher. I'm gonna walk out this valley with my Lord, with my Lord, with my Lord, with my Lord. Amen. Amen. Who's ready to walk on? Amen. If you're saved, say amen. amen. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. If you're saved and you know it and you're happy about it, say amen. 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 Do we have any tired saints in the church tonight? Amen. amen. No hesitation with that one, huh? I feel you. I feel you. I just wanted to um, testify to you just a little bit. Um, we had a testimony earlier, and God is good. Amen. He provides. That's all I can say. Uh, truly, God has provided for me as well. Um, there was, um, I was working in a job where it's not what I went to school for. It wasn't, you know, it's one of those things where every time my dad and I would sit down and talk about it, he's like, you have so much more potential in this. And I'm thinking, Dad, I've been looking and I have been looking and I've been putting everything out there that I can and nothing is opening up for me. No doors are opening. There's nothing I can do but just stay where God has put me until he moves me out. And it just so happened, I kept praying, Lord, when you're ready, open the door. You know, show me where to go. Because I wanted to have a job where I could use my degree and, you know, use what I went to school for. Um, I mean, truly, that was my desire. And out of nowhere, literally nowhere, God sent me a job that I wasn't even looking for, that I didn't even know was out there. Um, and he, he made a way. He truly made a way. And he, it's in, you know... It's a job that's out of my comfort zone. It's in a job that has making me use my brain like I've never used it before. So I'm grateful for what God's going to do there. And uh, there was a, a guy at, at my job who he was asking me a little bit about myself, trying to get to know me. And um, he was saying, how did you find out about this job? Because they hadn't put it out to anybody that they were looking for this position. And I said, Jesus found me this job. And I, sometimes things just pop out of your mouth before you're ready to catch it and filter it to like what people are typically ready to hear. And he just looks at me and smiles. He was like, you're one of those, aren't you? And I was like, you know what? Jesus provided for me, so I'm going to give him the credit. Amen. You know what? It wasn't my degree that got me the job because they didn't come at me for my degree. They didn't come at me for any of my experience because there was none that I had for this position. It was a job that they truly just created on their own, and it was because of God that he gave me that job. So I want to give him all the credit. Amen. So I want to be preaching to you for just a few moments tonight on a subject titled, Be Strong. Everybody turn to your neighbor right now and say, How strong are you? Now look to your other neighbor and flex your muscle for him. Show him how strong you are. 
If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be uh, reading from just a few different passages. We're going to be reading from Joshua chapter 1, verse 9 first. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. If you're there, say amen. amen. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says this, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We're going to read that one one more time. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Our next is going to be um, from Judges chapter 16. Just flip forward just a little bit there. Judges chapter 16, starting in verse 6. Get there, say amen. Amen. It says this. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. We're going to jump down to verse 17. Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. And then down to 21. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. And our final verse will be from Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Another version says this. If we are in the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Amen? If you will, uh, will you reach your hands toward me and help me pray that God will anoint my mouth and give us the best word that he has for us tonight. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to to be in your house tonight, God, to be in your presence, Lord. Father, I pray right now that you will anoint my mouth to preach your word, God, that you will anoint our hearts and ears to hear from you tonight. God, I pray that you will give us your strength and your courage to to come closer to you, God, and to be the very best men and women of God we could ever be. God, I pray right now that you will let your word go forth and do what it was sent to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How many of you feel like you're strong in here tonight? Bernardo's got both hands up, ready to flex, right? I can't lie. There are times when I don't feel very strong. Um, I have learned a trick. Let me tell you this trick I've learned. Are you ready? I'm going to confess it a little bit, but you can't tell anybody what my trick is, all right? If you are needing something done, all right, and I have tested and proved this to be effective every single time, all right? So that's why it's very important that it doesn't get out. I'm just going to share it with you because I love you, and I want you to be helped by it. If you have something you want done, and there's there's somebody standing next to you, you start complimenting their muscles, all right? You start saying, hey, man, you're looking good. All of a sudden, you know, I've got a bunch of chairs in the classroom that I need put away or that I need folded up. And I look over and I say, Aaron, have you been working out, Aaron? You got some big muscles going on there. You know, most times, every time that I have done that, they're ready to go, what do you need? I need these chairs moved. Could you move these chairs? And they're like, they don't want to make two or three trips. They want to show you how big those muscles are. They will put all of those chairs in their arms and carry them out for you every single time. But you can't tell nobody that, okay, because there are some people in this church that I use that on, and it works every time like a charm. Okay, and but truly, there are times when I know that I am not strong enough to do something on my own. Amen. Anybody ever be ever anyone ever feel that way before? There are times when you know you're looking at a situation, you see the problem in front of you, and you know that you can't do it. There is no no question. There is no exercise routine. There is no yoga class. There is no Pilates class. Whatever these things are, there is nothing you can do to strengthen yourself enough to be able to do it, right? So you need the help of somebody else, right? And I can't help to think in Joshua chapter 1, 
It was Joshua's very first battle that he had to face. And it was, it was this very big city. It was this very big problem. It was something that he could po- not possibly could not do on his own. There was no way, no chance that they would ever be victorious without the help of somebody else. They were never victorious on their own. The Israelites were never victorious when they tried to do things their own way. It was only when God stepped in and showed off his strength, showed off his mighty muscles, that they were ever able to have victory. So the very first thing that God tells Joshua as he begins to step in into leadership He tells him, this is what I command you to do. This is what I require of you tonight. And God is telling his church, I have requirements for you. And this is what I require of you. Do not be afraid of the problem in front of you. Do not be discouraged of the things that tell you you're not good enough. Do not be overcome with fear fear and think that there is no way out. Do not ever think that there is nothing that I cannot do. Don't think that it's too hard for me. Don't think it's too hard for anything that I can do because if you will just look at this problem and be strong in your heart and be courageous in your heart, I will move through you and you will walk through that valley. You will come out with your head high. Amen. God is telling you tonight, I have requirements for you, and that is to be strong and courageous. Don't let yourself be overcome with fear. On Tuesday night, we were listening to one of our brothers in Christ. He was preaching this message to his church, and he was saying, we have to put on the whole armor of God. And there were some things that I was, I was listening to him, and I, I can't lie, I was drifting a little bit because it was quite late. But he was doing such a great job, and he was explaining the importance of the helmet. And he said that the helmet protects you, not just when things come at you, but when people start to talk to you. He was explaining how when you put on the helmet, it covers your ears. It protects what's going into your mind. Because so often the devil wants to come to you and begin to whisper lies that you can't do it. That God is not able to provide for you this time. That it's not going to work out this time. That there is something that you're facing that is too big. That is too crazy. That it is too unexplainable. That there's no way out. And the enemy will begin to lie to you and say it's not going to work this time. It's going to fall apart. You're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to overcome it. And he begins to instill fear in you and lie to you and rob you of the joy of your salvation. What, what a day when a Christian is robbed of their joy. When your sins are under the blood, when your sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and the enemy begins to lie to you and try to undo every bit of joy that Christ has poured out onto you, the love of God that has covered you in peace and, 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 and his goodness and his mercy, and the enemy begins to rob that just by his words. Amen? Who's the enemy tried to lie to you tonight? Amen? He begins to lie to you, and if you're not careful, if, you're, if your head is not guarded, you'll lose, right? And so he was saying, put on the helmet, not just because you're, you need to protect yourself in battle, but because you need to cover your ears. You need to be careful what you're listening to. And Joshua was being told, be strong and be courageous. Don't be afraid, because I will be with you wherever you go. And then when I was reading about Joshua and his strength in in, in this verse, it really sticks out to me. This is one of the first verses that I ever memorized in children's church. It was one of my very first ones. And that's why I always always go back to this one for encouragement. Because some things just stick with you, right? Like Father Abraham, there are some things, no matter how many years go by, it will still torture you, right? It never leaves your memory. But there are some things that you are grateful to remember, right? And his word is something that I want to hold on to. And I was thinking about how could Joshua possibly be strong and courageous enough on his own to face a, a city that had never been overtaken before them, to face a people that were sitting in the very promises that God had given to the Israelites, that God had promised to them, that God had shown them that they could have it. How could he possibly be strong enough or courageous enough to think that he could do it? 
But you see, I, I believe that God was not telling him to be strong and courageous at the problem that he was facing, but be strong and courageous enough to know that no matter what lie the enemy tells you, no matter what he tries to do to trick you into thinking that it's not going to work out or that it won't happen or that God's promises aren't going to come about, no matter what he tries to tell you, be strong enough in the word to know that our God is not a liar, that our God is for us and not against us. Be courageous enough to know that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, that you can overcome anything in this world. If you have someone living in you who is greater than he that's in the world, who can stop us? Who can be against us if, against us if God is for us? There is nothing we can accomplish in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? Give God a hand clap. He's not telling Joshua to flex his muscle. He's telling Joshua, flex your faith. Amen? Sometimes we need to strengthen our faith and know that our faith needs to be made strong. And thinking about strength and thinking about the story of Samson, he was known as the, the strongest man. Truly, you read his story, there is no one that can match his strength. No one could compare to the things that he could do. He was the man who literally took a lion by the mouth and ripped him in two. He was the man who took the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand men on his own. Who can compare to a strength like that? Who can compare to things like that? You have a, a devil coming at you and you grip him by the mouth and tear him in two, or you have a thousand problems facing you and you pick up one little thing and you begin to slay them all. Who can do those things? Who can honestly say that when you leave church tonight, if the devil brought a thousand things against you, you could defeat every single one of them without fail? No pressure, right? No pressure. It was a strength that no one could possibly match. It was a strength that no one could understand. It was a strength that no one could wrap their mind around. How could he possibly have this strength? It was because God chose him before he was even born to do a work for his people, to be that one that brought his people out of oppression by the Philistines. And God said, I'm going to set him apart. I'm going to make him different. I'm going to use him for my glory. But you see, there was something different about Samson's story. Often the Lord would move on Samson. It says that the spirit of God would come upon him and he would have this great strength, this great ability. But you see, Samson made a lot of bad choices. Samson chose things that he was supposed to be set apart from. Samson was chose at birth to be a Nazarite, there were standards, there were expectations for him, much like Christians today, there are standards for us, there are expectations from the word of God, and though it may seem harsh at times, it's for our good, amen? But you see, Samson was the man who said, he wanted it both ways. He wanted to be able to use the spirit of the Lord when he needed it. But when he didn't need that strength of God, when he didn't need the spirit of the Lord, he would choose things that he knew was wrong. He would play with sin. He would play with sin. He would play with the enemy. And he would almost go back on God a little bit. He would sin outright. He would do things that he knew he wasn't supposed to be doing. And because of that, it was his own weakness that led him into his death. You see, Samson never had any kind of regard for the word of God. Samson never kept the standards that God had called him to, to live by. Samson never lived up to his God-given potential. And tonight, God has given us so much potential. His plans for us are so good. His plans and his, and his hope for us is so big. And he says, if you can just rely on my strength, if you can let me encourage you with my word, encourage you with my spirit, you 
you can do all things. You can live up to your God-given potential. You can become such a mighty man or woman of God that you can do all things, that you can defeat a thousand enemies that come against you. You can take the very enemy by the mouth and rip him in two. You can do anything through Christ who gives you strength. There is nothing that can stop you but ourselves. You see, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 that it, it talks about the spirit being led by the spirit versus being led by your flesh. How many of you guys ever struggle with your flesh? Amen? Your flesh will lie to you. Your flesh will tell you that you're too tired to pray. Your flesh will tell you that you're too tired to preach. Your flesh will tell you that you're too tired to keep doing the things of God that you know you're supposed to be doing, the things that God has told you are your standards or your expectations, the things that God requires of his church to pray, to fast, to seek the face of God, to seek God over the things of this world, to put God first over anything in your life. He's telling you that's what I require of you. That's what I want from you. I want you to turn to me. I want you to use my strength. I want you to be encouraged by my spirit. You see, God is someone who wants to to use us and, and to do great things for us. He tells us in Jeremiah that if we call upon him, he will show us great and mighty things that we've never even thought possible before, that we could have never even imagined. But you see, Joshua was a man who had spiritual strength, and Samson was a man who only had physical strength. His spirit was lacking the strength of God. His spirit was lacking that devotion to God and his word. You see, Samson was a man who let his flesh get in his way. His flesh told him, I want this more than I want the things of God. I want this more than I want to live for God because God had put some tough standards on him. You read the Bible, don't ever tell a lie. Don't ever hate anyone. Don't ever speak a word that's bad against anybody. Those are tough things sometimes. But when we choose to do the things of our flesh over the things of the Spirit of God, we're saying, I want this more than I want the Spirit of God moving in my life. You see, and it's those small choices that we make, those small choices to our flesh that lead us to the bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger things to where suddenly we're blinded spiritually. Samson walked his entire life being blinded spiritually until he was eventually physically blind as well. You see, there's, there's so much to Samson that if you reread his story again, I know it's, it's something that... You know, anyone in children's church, in good old Church of God, we had the felt boards. Anybody know what the felt boards are? You had the little characters they would put up there for you. Samson had those big muscles. He had to walk like this, kind of like when you see Norman coming in, he's ready to move the tables for you. He's our Samson, right? But truly, Samson was a man that my entire life growing up, I thought he was just this big, strong dude that he just kind of was in the wrong place at the wrong time and something bad happened to him. I never really understood what got him to that place, what got him into that trouble, what got him bound, what got him blinded, you know, what, what got him to that point to where he was dying. And, and I never understood that because as a kid, you only focus on, oh, he was so strong, oh, he was able to do all these great things, but he had so much more potential than just to kill a thousand men or just to kill one lion. He had so much more potential. He had so much more that God had planned for him to do, that God had purposed for him to do. And and what a day when we enter the glory world and God says to, says to one of his saints, I had so much more I could have done through you. I had so much more that I wanted to do for you or, and through you. And I never want to be a woman of God who God looks and says, I had so much more for you. But because you couldn't get past your flesh, because you couldn't stop choosing the things of the world over the things of my word, over the things of my spirit, I can never give you your full potential. I can never ever do everything that I had planned for you because you wouldn't choose my spirit. You see, true strength and courage in, the, in God's word, it's not measured physically. It's measured by your heart. It's, it's 
being strong enough to allow yourself to be weak. You see, Joshua was a man who had to stand before his battle, who had to stand before every enemy and say, I am not strong enough to do this on my own. I can't do this on my own. I can't make it on my own. And he had to cling to God and his spirit. You see, Samson never fully committed his heart to God. Samson never let God's spirit lead him. He let the spirit of God move him and give him strength when he needed it, but he never let the spirit of God lead his life and direct his life and guide his life and speak to him and go the places that God wanted him to go. And how many Christians in the church today, they will let the spirit of God bless them. They will let the spirit of God move for their problems or 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 they will pray that conviction off of themselves when they've been in their flesh, but they will never let the Spirit of God lead their life or direct their life or speak to them every day. We need a church of men and women of God who will stand up in the Spirit of God and say, I will choose God over the things of this world. I can't take one step without Him. I can't walk in my flesh. I have to walk in the Spirit of God. I have to keep in step with His Spirit. And the minute you get out of the step with Him, you go back into prayer. In Galatians 5 and 24, it says this. It says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's a daily choice because our flesh will constantly try to rise up. Our flesh will constantly bring us things that we want or, or it will tempt us with things. But like we learned in Sunday school, a temptation is not the sin. It's your opportunity to have a testimony to say that God was working in me and provided a way out of, of doing the things that my flesh wanted to do. You see, sometimes we will fail God. Sometimes we will mess up. Sometimes we will give into temptation but thanks be to God who even though when we have shaved our head when we have given away all the strength and we have turned away from the spirit he is still letting the hair grow back even then he's giving us a chance to have his mercy even then he's making a way to bring us back into a right relationship with him even when we turn away even when we give up on him sometimes even when we don't believe that he's able God is still making a way to show us his mercy to show us his love and his grace and he's saying if you can just turn back one more time if you can just come back into my presence and see that I am good and see that I have good plans for you plans to prosper you not to harm you plans to give you a hope and an expected end plans to do great and mighty things that you've never thought possible before you see when I read things like that Let me, let, me, let me explain one of our lovely bus kids to you for just a moment. His name is Braylon. How many of you guys, you've seen the twins running around? You know who the twins are. Shake your head at me if you know who, who the twins are. Shake your head at me if you've been a victim of the twins. I love them. They were letting me rub their heads for good luck tonight. I was telling them, I said, I was nervous. Let me rub your head for good luck. So they were both giving me their heads. And then Braylon says to me, he says, you can get more lucky if you want. (laughs) Just rub his head, rub his head, rub his head. Anything to keep him still, right? Braylon last week, let me tell you about Braylon. Braylon, they like gum a lot, okay? They like gum, and Braylon kept saying, can I have a piece of gum? Can I have a piece of gum? And I, I, uh, I use that as my my flexing muscle, right? I'll give you a piece of gum, but you gotta sit down and make it through this song. I know Misty sings a lot of songs. I know they're long. I know they're boring songs. But you got to make it through her song, and I'm going to give you a piece of gum, right? If you can just make it through one more song, I'm going to give you the biggest piece of gum, and you're going to chew it, chew it, chew it, and blow a big bubble, right? And he kept begging me for gum. And finally, I was like, Braylon, you have not made it through the first song yet. You can't have a piece of gum yet. And then I turn around. Braylon has a whole double pack of gum in his pocket. And I say to him, Braylon, you tricked me. You made me think that you had, you were wanting some gum and I was going to get you to work for it. You've got gum in your pocket. I said, you're a little gum hoarder. What are you doing? And he goes, I just wanted to see what yours tasted like. 
I have been a, vi a victim of Braylon from the bus. All of my gum, all of my dollars that the concession stand gets from me, it's going away into Braylon's pocket. He's, he's a genius. But you see, how many people, they want to just store up and store up the blessings that God gives them and store them up and store them up and put them in their pocket. God, I need you to bless me in this way. Thank you, Jesus, and put it in your pocket. God, I need you to bless me one more time. Thank you, Lord, and put it in your pocket. But you never live your life being led by the Spirit of God, being led by His Spirit and saying, God, I want to take your blessings and I want to share them with someone else. God, I want to take your blessings and I want to show the world how great and how mighty you are. See, we have a bunch of spoiled brats in church today. Oh, they just want to sit on the blessings of God. They just want to sit in their comfy pew and never grow in the spirit. They never want to mature in the spirit because they know that it requires something out of them. But let me tell you, the person, the Christian, the child of God that does not fully give their heart over to the spirit of God and lets the spirit of God move in them and mature them and grow in them and, 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 and make them someone better and make them someone closer to God, that is just as much sin as the, as the sinner who won't turn to Christ because of their habit. That is just as much sin as the Christian who will not fully devote their heart to God but want to be blessed by God again and again and again. But they never want to be led by the Spirit of God or do the things that God requires of them. Is this too harsh? Uh-oh. Let me tell you how good his strength is. You see, a lot of Christians, they think that they're strong if they can quote a lot of Bible. And that's good. Quote Bible all day, right? A lot of Christians think that it, it means you're strong if you can speak in tongues all the time. And that's good. Speak in tongues all the time. And a lot of Christians think... It's, it means you're strong if you can run in the aisles and, and, and jump around and dance around in the spirit. And that's good. Run, jump, and dance. A lot of Christians at the mission think it means you're strong if you say yes when Pastor Wayne texts you and says, I need you. I have a job for you. You're going to need the strength and courage. Amen. 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 Can I get an amen, church? Amen. amen. How many of you have ever been approached by Pastor Wayne? I, I need you. How strong are you? Have you been working out those muscles really good? That's who I got that trick from. But you see, true strength and courage only comes aside when we, lay it, when we put aside our own efforts. True strength and courage comes only when we stop trying to quote as many verses as we can or speak in tongues as much as we can or run the aisles as much as we can. True courage is, is forgiving the ones who have mistreated you. True courage is praising God before he even makes a way through the promised land. True courage is giving his word and not your own opinion. True courage is saying yes to the spirit and no to your flesh, even though it's hard, even though it's difficult, even though it requires you to crucify your flesh, to, to die to yourself, to feel that pain. True courage requires you to say yes to him. You see, in Acts chapter 8, there was a man who, who followed God. He, he was a man who was being led by the Spirit of God. His name was Philip. You see, God told him to go a certain way. And I like how it says it in Acts chapter 8. I don't think I gave this one to them. I'm going to read it to you from what I have. Acts chapter 8. Philip was a man who was ready to hear God's Spirit talk to him. And there's something to be said about someone who's ready to hear God speak. Sometimes it means you have to be quiet. Sometimes it means that even when you have a lot of things that you need God to move on, you have a lot of things that you need him to help you with, it means still being quiet in those moments and saying, but God, I need to hear from you first. He says in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
this is a desert place. God was telling Philip, I want you to get up and I want you to go to a place that you've never been before. I want you to go to the middle of nowhere. See, sometimes God is calling us out of the busyness of our life, out of our own routine, out of our own convenience, out of our own comforts, and he's saying, I want you to go to a desert place. I want you to go to a place where you don't have any reason to have any strength or any courage. There's no strength in a desert place. There's no courage in a desert place. But I want you to be led by my spirit. I want you to go to this place and wait for me. Sometimes it's the toughest things that we go through that God wants us to go through the most. It's the places where there is no one to turn to. It's the places where no one can say the right thing for you. It's the place where no one understands exactly how you feel. It's the place where no matter how long you pray, you feel like no one's listening to you. It's that place where you feel like no matter how long you fast, no no matter how long you wait, there is no answer coming. But it's in that place that God has something great for you to do. You see, sometimes we want to reject the desert place. We want to reject the valley. We want to get away from it because it's hard. Because it's painful there. Because it's lonely there. Because we don't know how to, how to be strong there. But God says, if you can go where I send you, if you can go where my spirit is telling you, I'm going to do something good for you there. Philip went to a place that was dry and dusty and there was no one near him. And he began to see a man and he began to hear God's word being read. So he followed God's word and he began to walk beside it. And he got inside the carriage and he began to explain to this man what God's word was saying. He began to give him the gospel. He began to pour out into somebody else. He didn't have anything that he needed. He, he probably was thirsty. He was probably hungry. He was probably wondering how he was going to get home. He was probably wondering how he was going to get out of this situation. Because so many times we get into situations where we just need the, the way out. We just need to figure out how is this going to work out. You have your problems. You have your family where you just don't understand or you're or your finances and it just looks like it's so big and it's so upsetting and you just want to know how is this going to work out but God says if you can just wait if you can just let my spirit lead you let my spirit flex your faith you can do something incredible in those places You can praise God before your answer comes. You can speak his word to someone else. If you can get your mind fixed on God and off of your problem, God's going to do something great for you. He went into the desert and he brought salvation. He brought God's spirit into that place. And that man who, who was hearing the word of God, who was hearing the salvation of Jesus Christ, gave his heart to the Lord in that desert place. And he was baptized in the name of Jesus. And that was not just any man. That was a eunuch. That was a man who worked in the palace of Ethiopia. That was a man who was going to take God's word back into the palace, back to where the king was, and he was going to share it with the leader of Ethiopia. You can't keep a man who's been saved in the desert quiet. You can't keep a man who's been all alone and has no one to turn to, no one to understand what he's going through and, and in the desert. And, and then you save his soul and you, you share the gospel with him. You can't keep someone like that quiet. But you see, God wants to do something for us that we never thought possible before. It's in that place that we can reach out to someone else. It's in the place where we don't have the answer that we can say, but I know who does. You see, in Genesis 5 and 21, we see a man named Enoch, and he was, he was going his own way. He was doing his own things. He was following his flesh until one day. He understood what God's word meant. He understood what his son's name meant, and he turned, and he began to follow God, and he kept in step with God so much that he was able to step into glory before he was ever even supposed to. And in Daniel 3, you have the three Hebrew children who followed the spirit of God into the fiery furnace, and they were able to step into a fire with an angel. The Bible says in Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. See, even when, 
even when we don't know where our next step is taking us, we can trust in the Spirit of God because He's going to take us to a place that we never thought possible before. Even if it means going through a desert place, even if it means going into the enemy's camp, even if it means facing a thousand men on our own, the Bible says that if God is for us, who can be against us? Even a thousand will fall. You see, I was reading about Jesus in, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, and it was about what happened to him before his ministry ever got started. Something incredible happened to him. He went to the Jordan and he was baptized. But you see, it's what happened right after he was baptized that gave him such a power. You see, the Bible says that when he came up out of the water, that the Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon him. You see, Jesus received the power of the Holy Spirit at that point. And then he began to minister. He began to do incredible things, things that we can only dream of, of healing the sick, of opening blind eyes, of doing these incredible things. And it's because he was being led by the Spirit of God. The Bible says that greater works are for us if we can have that same spirit. If you can let the spirit of God lead you, you can lay hands on the blind in your family, the ones that are spiritually blind, the ones that are like Samson and and they just want to rely on their own strength, they just want to do things their own way and and live for the world and and have the things of the world. If if we can lay hands on them and, and share the word of God with them and know that their eyes will be open, we can see salvation come to our family, even in the desert places, even when it looks like they're too far gone, that they're too far away from God, we can speak his word over them, we can speak his love over them and we can see them come back to Jesus. Amen. Church, more than ever, I believe that we need his spirit to lead us. We're going into desert places as a nation. We're going into places that we've never seen before. We're going into places where we don't see a way out. I don't see a way out of the way that our government is going today. I don't see a way out. I don't see a way out of, out of the things that Obama has done to our nation. I don't see a way out of the things that are coming against the church, that are coming against the children of God around the world. I don't see a way out, but I know that I serve the way, the truth, and the life, and that there is nothing that can come against me, that there is no weapon formed against me that can prosper, but I need his spirit. I need his spirit to lead me and to guide me. I want his spirit more than I want the things of my flesh. I want my flesh to be crucified so that I can go into these desert places with our nation and I can speak his word and power and authority and to say that there is no one better than Jesus Christ. There is no one better. There is no healer. There is no comforter. There is no friend other than my Lord in Jesus. You see, in Acts chapter 1, this is my last verse, it says it in verse 8 that you will receive power when, who knows it, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You can't have power to slay a thousand men. You can't have power to, to rip your enemy in half. Samson At the very end of his story, he looks up to God and he says, God, strengthen me one more time. I think there are too many churches today that are like Samson. They want God to move when they're ready. They want God to do things when they want it done. They want God to follow their plan. They want God to follow their ideas. They want God to follow their way. But they don't understand what it is to be led by the Spirit of God. If we had churches that were like Joshua... And that no matter how big the government got, no matter how big and scary the, you know, the laws were, that they would still be strong and courageous enough to say that the word of God is still true. 
too many churches are bowing down to the things of this world. Too many Christians are turning away from what the word of God says because it's too harsh to the world. But if we can stand up and be a people of God who are led by his spirit and who say that his word is still true today, yesterday and forever, his word is still good, even though it hurts, even though it means that we have to give up the things that we think we want, the things that we think we need, even though it means that we have to die to ourselves, we can have every promise of God. We can have every power of God working in us to do great and mighty things through this world, to lay hands on the sick and see them recovered, to see blind eyes open, to see the dead in their hearts, the dead in their spirit, raise up and become new creatures in Christ. Will you stand with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord is your Savior, you don't have a relationship with, you, with Him, I want you to know that God has brought you here tonight because he's making a way for you because he is making a way for you to come back to him we serve a god who wants us we serve a god who wants to do good things for us and if you're here and you need to give your heart to the lord you need to make things right with god i want you to come forward don't be afraid don't be ashamed If you're here tonight and you say, I need his spirit more than ever before. I need his spirit. I need his strength and his power. I want you to find yourself a place to pray. And I want you to seek God's spirit. If you're here and you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I want you especially to come up for special prayer. It's here for you tonight. His spirit is waiting on you. The Bible says in Acts, it says in the word of God, it says, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. But you see, he says, first you have to ask, first you have to seek, and first you have to knock. Let's seek God's face here tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity, God, to hear from you. Lord, right now I ask that you will please pour out your spirit on this place, God. God, that you will hear every single man and woman in this place, Lord, as they seek your face. Lord, meet us here tonight. Give us your strength. Give us your courage to be the men and women of God that we're called to be. Let us live up to our God-given potential, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.
Wayne do. Yeah. Amanda did a good job tonight, didn't she? Amen. It's her first sermon after working almost a full 40-hour week. She didn't do bad. Where she has to get up early in the morning. and She told me a while back that she's ready to be used more. She wants to be used more. Okay. Right? Tuesday I called her. I need you. Wednesday I called her. I need you. And so help me. About 9 o'clock she's looking at me. Can I go now? No. We're not done yet. Right? She's a big girl now. She's got to get up early in the morning and drive to work. Amen. Anybody else have to do that? For Yeah, me too. Okay. So it's kind of hard for us old people to have pity on these youngins. Amen. God is so good, isn't he? He's very, very good. She was talking about the bus kids, and one of the other bus kids tonight, he came up to me and basically took the offering play out of my hand because he wanted to take the offering. And when I got to the back, um, I think it was Aaron said to me, was it you that said it to me? One of the little boys was going around, and he was taking up the offering, and those people found that weren't putting any money in the offering plate. And his question to them was something like this. What? You don't have any money? I'm like, I think I want him to be an usher from now on. Amen. So I think I'm going to put him with Brian and Jay on Sunday. Two big brute guys standing there with the little guy in the middle of them saying, what, you don't have any money? And then flexing their muscles in the background. Amen. So I have a feeling that our offerings will go up, and I'll get them a card reader. So that way, if they don't have ca or cash, like we, we'll take cash or credit card, whatever you want, sir. Sound like a plan? Amen. Those little kids don't know any better, do they? They just know when the offering comes around, you're supposed to put something in. That's all they know. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? They know when they come to church, a man is going to whip out and give them a piece of gum. Amen. That's all right. That's okay. They look at me, gum. No, get your own. Buy your own. Amen. I mean like that, but that's okay. Tomorrow night is our fellowship meeting over at the Heart of Worship, and our praise and worship team will be singing, technically not praise and worship, but some couple specials toward the end there so if you can please come out if you need a ride let me know we'll have to we'll take the van over we'll, we'll get you there but uh paula farmer does anybody know who paula farmer is she's gonna be the one preaching tomorrow night pretty sure she's retired from pastoring now so maybe she'll get back to her old evangelist ways amen pastoring has a way of taking the evangelist out of you so hopefully she's gotten back into that so if you can, please come out with us. I think we'll have a really good time. If you do go, understand this. The church that we're going to is a little bit smaller than what we're used to. And me personally, I know some folks don't like to go to those smaller churches, but, you know, I was raised on this district. I know what fellowship meetings are all about, and I have been in churches where it's been wall-to-wall, elbow-to-elbow, riding the church van down and back for about however long. That doesn't bother me in the least. You can have my seat if you don't want to stand up because I have no problem with that. I think our kids need to know what fellowship meetings are all about. I really do. I think our families need to know what fellowship meetings are all about. I think we need to know what a little bit of discomfort is when it comes to serving God. Because honestly, guys, we're used to padded pews and air conditioning and carpet and all. we're used to that stuff. O'Toneal down, or not O'Toneal, but Tito down in El Salvador where he's at. His shed looks better, but it's still a shed. I think they have chairs now. I'm pretty sure they don't have air conditioning. I don't think he's put a true door on the front of it yet. But you know what? They have Sunday school now, and they still worship God, and they're still growing, and they're still reaching the lost. So if he has that and he's doing it, what we have... We really have no excuses, do we? Amen. Invite somebody to church this weekend. Would you do that, please? Tell them about David Gosnell being here both times on Sunday. Last time he was here, he preached the doors off. So I think you're going to want to be here. He's really, really, really good. Talk to him on the phone today. Sounds like he's gotten a little bit more country. I don't know how you pull that one off. 
but he sounds a little bit more southern to me now, so maybe we'll see what he does on Sunday. Will you stand, please? As I was sitting over here thinking, I know we forgot about Kim and Ed, and I know they're sick, and we have a sister back here whose ankles are bad, and I know Kim's got two braces on her feet. More people that need to be healed, amen? More people that need God's touch. Do you go home and pray about these people? If not, make a list. And go home and start writing about her, reading about her. Would you do that? Reading. I can't even talk. Pray about them. How about that? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for this wonderful service. Thankful for your blessings. Thankful for the word, great God. Father, I pray that you would go with us now, God. Help us to be great lights of this world, Lord. Father, help us, great God, to spread the gospel, God, and to reach those that need to be reached. And we'll thank you for everything you do, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Give God a big hand clap and love on one another. Would you do that, please? So when you're on your knees and 